tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 24 of Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and we have just one more episode before the end of Season 6. Tonight's tale comes to us from prolific author Ralph Robert Moore and reminds us how gambling, alcohol, and lust aren't always the best combination. Buckle up and strap in, listeners, because this one is truly a weird tale and is exceptionally well written. I hope that you enjoy it as much as I did. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, from author Ralph Robert Moore, I give you Not Everything Has a Name. An ordinary closet, the type seen so often over the course of a life. Not that large. Wooden rod hung horizontally high enough to allow room on the floor for shoes. A shelf above the rod for storage. Empty at first. Then, a rush of wire hangers, some bare, the rest with folded over blue jeans, plaid, and striped shirts. Over the months, some of the jeans change to dress slacks, and white shirts appear, a hanger just for ties. Some sport jackets, and at one point, in the center, a navy blue suit. Then, a gray pinstripe suit, and more ties, and more white shirts. All by itself, a woman's pink blouse on a wooden hanger, a second blouse, a skirt, a dress as blue as a pair of eyes. The plaid and striped shirts start vanishing, 
replaced by brighter colors, better tailoring, name designers. Then, more women's clothes than men's clothes in that closet. Most of the flirtier skirts and blouses were gradually replaced with more modest clothes. And then, set apart from all the other hanging clothes, white royalty amongst streetwear, encased in glossy, see-through plastic. A wedding dress. The shelf above the rod, once empty, fills with different sized boxes. Over the years, many of the clothes disappear, replaced by others. Eventually, some of the more modest women's clothes leave as flirtier clothes come back. Then, on the floor with the shoes, most of them women's shoes by now, an oxygen tank. A second tank to use when the first runs out. And one sad morning, the dress, as blue as a pair of eyes, is selected and unhangered. Not too many changes in the months that follow. Then one afternoon, all the women's clothes unhangered, folded into cardboard boxes, given to charity. And once again, only men's clothes hang in that closet. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Taking a quick break here to show some love to a sponsor that's shown so much to us, BetterHelp Online Therapy. I love to read books and play games on my phone in my downtime. I once knew someone a long time ago that had to avoid certain types of television because they got too invested. If something bad happened in the show, it would cause them deep emotional unrest for the remainder of the day. Then, on the other hand, I also had a friend who literally cried when he noticed a scratch on his used car. My point is that the smallest things can grab the investment of your time and emotional resources. Sadly, too often your own mental health isn't something that's on that list. I admit that in the past, checking in on my mental health wasn't something I thought about much, if at all, really. We all know how our mind affects how we experience life so it's important to invest time and care into keeping it healthy. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain, like learning a new language or skill. However, there's also BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that'll help you deal with life's difficulties, quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. It's helped me through countless situations. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties, whether it be grief, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, etc. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With better help, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. Horror Hill podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. Tommy drove Sheila out to the valley, pulled up in front of a one-story building with no windows. Beat up cars in the small parking lot, plus one shiny red convertible. Sheila released her seatbelt, retracting a clip rippling her blouse, swung her eyes to Tommy. Is this safe? It doesn't look safe. He brushed his hair from his forehead, smirked. It's cool, I've been here before scrunched his eyebrows, his sophisticated look. Too scared to follow your bad boy inside? Tommy's palm pushing the wooden front door open, letting out the wails of Middle Eastern music. Dark as a cave inside. Cigarette smoke. Cue balls clicking. She was the only female. 
Big men with their thick legs sprawling forward off bar stools or standing around the one pool table, overhead light shining down onto the green felt. Click. Colored ball rolling its number to the deep shadows of a corner pocket. Tommy, shoulders held high on his body, making his way self-consciously into the pungent darkness, looking around for anyone he knew, which was no one. Sheila held onto the back of his shirt, pinching it, tingling from all the male gazes. Her boyfriend went to the end of the bar, where there were no big bodies, lifted his scared jaw to get the bartender's attention. Couple of beers? The fat bartender, beard down to his shirt buttons, wandered over. We don't serve baby formula here. Maybe you should try sucking on your mom's tit. Tommy laughed like it was a friendly joke. (laughs) So, can I get a beer? The bartender slid his eyes to Sheila. You want a Shirley Temple? Sheila, standing up on tiptoe. Okay. The bartender reached under the bar, tattooed arms lifting up bottles and jars, adding ice. There you go, miss. She looked down at her dark drink. So, what is this? Coca-Cola and ice cubes, maraschino cherry at the bottom. About all I'm going to serve you. Tommy rested an elbow on the polished wood of the bar. Can I get one of those? Sure can't. That's a girl's drink. I'm not going to contribute towards turning anyone into a pansy. Let this boy have a poontang. Tommy and Sheila turned around from the bar. The man who spoke held a pool cue in his hand. Tall, black-haired, broad-shouldered, beat-up face, and the bluest eyes Sheila had ever seen. Tommy, elbow resting on the bar, trying to be a part of the crowd. What's a poontang? The tall man went back to the pool game, waist bent forward, lining up his next shot. The bartender answered for him. Shot of whiskey, splash of cherry juice, fermented fish sauce from Thailand poured in until the whole fucking drink turns black. Apologies for my bad language, miss. Not every man can swallow a poontang. Some choke up on it. Tommy shrugged it off, wrapped his little knuckles on the wood of the bar. One poontang, please. Three poontangs later... The tall stranger at the pool table asked Tommy if he wanted to play a game of eight ball. Tommy's dad had a pool table in the family game room. Tommy played a lot. With his dad. Thought he was pretty good. Bragged about what a pool hustler he was. To his friends. Tommy. Trying to act cool. Ben. The tall stranger stuck out his hand. We don't have to do a lag. You can call it. Hundred bucks a game. We double and double for subsequent games. You ready for that? Sure, I'll set up the rack. Tommy made sure he got the rack right. Eight ball two rows back from the apex ball, lined up with the apex ball. Didn't want to embarrass himself in front of this shadowy circle of big men. Sheila sat on a stool to one side where she could watch the two men play. What women do. Doe watching two bucks bang antlers. Couldn't see the balls clacking across the green felt from this angle, but didn't need to. Obvious from the changing expressions on her boyfriend's face if he was losing, or thought he was winning. Mostly, she watched Ben. Probably about 30. Not so much handsome as rough. Even better deep voice, moved around the table with confidence, sticking the tip of his pool cue deep up into the square of blue chalk, rubbing it around inside with an easy familiarity. He might do. Tommy straightened up. Damn. Guess he lost. Play again? Okay. After Tommy lost his fifth game... Ben straightened up in the shadows, head taller than her boyfriend, broader shoulders, thinner waist. So, 
Looks like you're into me for 3,100. Maybe time to stop? Pay up? Sheila knew Tommy didn't have that kind of money on him, or in the bank. She could see how small his eyes had shrunk, surrounded by all these dangerous men. The voice of a mouse addressing cats. Double or nothing? Ben said nothing for a moment, leaning forward with both big hands wrapped around the top of his cue stick like it was a cane. Then his large, cruel face split into a white-toothed grin. Double or nothing, you don't say. Tommy scrunched up his shoulders like a girl. That little hipster goatee wasn't going to help him this time. Tell you what, okay, just show us the $3,100 in your pocket first, so we know you're not full of shit. Got real quiet in that pool hall. I don't. Ben's eyes bored right in on Tommy's. I don't what? I don't, you know. No, I don't know, Tommy. You agreed to a game. I told you the betting structure. You agreed. I even skipped the lag so you could decide who shot first. So what the fuck else am I supposed to know? Tommy's eyes went everywhere around the room just so they didn't have to look at Ben's angry stare. I don't have that much money on me, but I'm good for it. Ben's grin came even slower this time. Really? I got in a little over my head. A little over your head? I'm really sorry. Ben burst into laughter, joined by the other men standing closer and closer. You're really sorry? Well, gosh, Tommy, why didn't you just say that? Tommy looked wildly relieved, then not so much once he realized it was a joke, then looking really scared. Double or nothing? Okay. You owe me $3,100, so we double it to $6,200. If I lose, you owe me nothing. You get to walk out of here, back into the sunshine, back home to your dad's pool table. Absolutely, okay. But what if you lose? Tommy could think of nothing to say. If you lose, then you'll have to give me something worth $6,200. Sheila sat up on her stool. What do you want? Another one of Ben's big grins. Tommy turned around to look at Sheila, not wanting to comprehend, but then, and she could see it in his face, wondering if that would be his way out. A little bit of confidence coming back into his eyes. That'd be up to my girlfriend. I don't own her. Course you don't. I'm just asking you, are you willing to bet her? Sheila, you want a way in here? I can't tell you what to do. It's up to you if you want to get me out of a tight spot or not. Still on her stool, she lifted her chin at Ben. First time she had ever looked directly into those blue eyes. And do what? Ben shrugged his big shoulders. If our boy here loses, you come back with me to my place, tidy it up, do some laundry, then bake me an apple pie. Tommy's inhale of breath. Sheila's faltering stare. Shit, who are we kidding? You come back to my place, I fuck you until we both can't walk. Okay. Tommy, your girlfriend just agreed to let me fuck her, slapping bodies against each other all night long. Comments? If she's agreeable to it, I... Doesn't really matter what he says after that, does it? Tommy lost the game. Ben stood in front of Sheila, who slid off her stool, looking up at his face, scared. You understand, you don't have to come with me if you don't want. I just needed to show your boy Tommy what he was. She shook her long hair away from her pretty face. She knew how to do that better than any other girl in her high school. I'll go with you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. 
By the time Ben pulled the bar's front door open, it was three o'clock in the morning. Outside, black and cool. Not too many stars out tonight. Tall beast that he was, Ben nevertheless held open the passenger door of his red convertible for her, like a gentleman, so she could slip inside. They roared through the hills up into the mountains, Ben taking the corners rough, Sheila screaming, laughing, grabbing onto the leather dashboard, slim shoulder bouncing off his bicep, until they pulled up to a roadhouse far above the lights of the city, nighttime dust puffing up behind the sudden stop of their car. She rose out of the passenger side of the red convertible in her high heels and party skirt, hearing the insects in the dark trees, young and fresh and pretty. Ben escorted her through the front door of the roadhouse, large palm on the small of her back. She liked his touch. Inside, country music on the radio. Most of the booths occupied, couples or men sitting by themselves. Everyone looked up, looked away. Nobody wanted to mess with Ben. First time she was with a man with that type of impact. The middle-aged waitress came over with menus, gave them both a friendly smile. Coffee? By the time she came back with their steaming cups, they were ready to order. We'll both have the same. Three eggs over easy, thick slice of ham, butter dry toast, home fries, orange juice. And she wants some vanilla ice cream afterwards. Coming right up. I like that you didn't rush into the restroom to brush your hair or reapply your makeup. She was feeling shy, so much smaller than him, looking down at her hands. What you see is what you get. What's the deal with Tommy? He's not the one, I'm guessing. Sure isn't. We were in a supermarket shopping for dinner and I found the perfect steaks for us, nicely marbled and on sale. I felt really proud. And this guy in his 20s wearing a suit comes along, spots them in my cart, and just reaches in and lifts them out, puts them in his own cart. What did our boy Tommy do when you told him? She rolled her eyes at Ben. Such a young thing to do. Nothing. I don't want to make a scene. Then, once we were home, he got really drunk, told me all these things he was prepared to say to the guy, beat the shit out of him, but didn't in order to protect me because otherwise he'd be so violent to that guy he'd get arrested. What would you have done? The look she gave him had worked up to flirtatious. He lit a cigarette. I would have killed him. Letting out a huff. Oh, sure. Not in the supermarket. I'd let him pay for our stakes, follow him out to the parking lot, pull him down to the space on the tar between his car and the car parked next to his car, and beat him to death for not treating you with respect and we'd get our stakes for free. She laughed, sitting back in her green seat. No, you wouldn't. Those blue eyes looked across their two breakfast plates at her. She wiped a slice of buttered rye toast across the pools of egg yolk on her white plate, sopping up all that rich yellow. You about 30? Yeah glanced out the dark window of the roadhouse, where all he could see beyond his own reflection was the high moon. This was fun, eating eggs with a new girl, late at night. That's not too old, I guess. His grin. Now you're really coming at me. You think you can get a handle on a 30-year-old man with your wiles like you can with an 18-year-old boy? Licking the butter off her fingertips, staring into his eyes. I've been pretty successful with my wiles. You ever been with a 30-year-old man before? I've been with a lot of old men, just not sexually. That would include my grandfather. He's real old. My grandfather told me getting real old feels a lot like being real young, when he used to do a lot of drugs. You keep forgetting things, and you have trouble getting out of a chair. He put out his cigarette crushing its glowing orange end like it was an insect's head. But someone broke you in as a girlfriend, right? What if I told you I was a virgin? I'd ask what parts of you are a virgin. 
My pussy and my rear end just about. What about your mouth? It's not virgin. All right, then. One out of three. Not too bad. Once their plates were cleared, the waitress brought over Sheila's bowl of vanilla ice cream. She pushed the white plastic spoon down into the melting vanilla mound, treating herself to a cold swallow, used the undersides of her fingers like a napkin, wiping where the ice cream dripped from her smirk. Want some? It'll cool you off. He took the cold bowl from her hand. She turned the white plastic spoon upside down, slid it into her mouth, brown eyes staring into his eyes, then pulled the humped whiteness out from between her lips. Now it's clean. As he dipped the top curve of the spoon into the vanilla ice cream, she leaned her face over the bowl, long, light brown hair spilling forward, and spit into the bowl clear bubbles sliding down the vanilla mound, looked into his eyes. Mixing of fluids. He brought the spoonful of ice cream up to his lips anyway. Cold. Sugary. You don't mind a little spit? Challenge in those eyes, which he figured she wanted him to see, but also sadness in the eyes, which maybe she thought she had hid. She cocked her jaw up at him, quite fetching, staring right into him. She had a really nice forehead. Can't say that about a lot of women. Smooth, tall, like there was a big brain behind the bone. I didn't see any girl at that bar with you. Shy around women? My wife died nine months ago. I keep to myself. Handed her back the bowl. She toned it down way down, lowered her jaw. That didn't occur to me, sorry. I just... Quick nod. It takes time. His silent face. She waited. After she was buried, after the funeral and everything, the next morning I woke up in our bed, alone. I turned on the local news for some companionship. Eventually, I got out of bed to make some coffee like this was just another normal day. I was in charge of making the morning coffee. I made a full pot. I didn't want to take the time to figure out how to make half the coffee I normally would. It beeped three times when it was ready, just like it would while she was still alive. I couldn't find a coffee cup anywhere, nowhere. Looked in the dishwasher. Looked on all the shelves, thinking maybe I put them on the wrong shelf because my mind was so preoccupied. But nothing. Looked in the bedroom, all the bathrooms. Nothing. Getting more and more frustrated. Angry. What the fuck is this? Why is this happening? And I never found any of the cups. We had like six of them. They were a set. So I wound up having to pour half and half into the coffee pot itself and carrying the coffee pot around with me, like it was this gargantuan coffee cup, sipping from its rim. That's when it really hit me that life was different now. Shook his head. Well, I guess we better... I have a scar. Huh? Because of, you know... Embarrassed shrug. Automobile accident. All those rushed syllables, summoning back that sadness. Where is it? He liked the way her head lifted. On my left chest. A piece of metal from the car just plowed through my flesh like a spaceship. It's really ugly. One of the reasons why I don't fuck guys face to face. Just stay home, watch TV, hang out with Tommy. Raised herself up on her elbows, scared. Lonely little kid's voice. Want to see it? Her fingers reached up to the left side of her red and white horizontally striped top, pulling down until the stripes slid off the top of her slender shoulder, bending their candy cane colors, bearing her collarbone, the warm, round top of her breast. Is there anything more tender? The raw, red, zigzag scar from collarbone across breast swell to cleavage. 
Ugly, huh? It's not so bad. Corrected himself. It's not bad at all. I think it's sexy, like a lightning bolt. Trying to believe. Yeah? Yeah. Sloppy grin. All right, sir. Well, you passed my spit test and my scar test. Now you just have to pass two more tests. He drove them further up into the mountains, pulled off onto a dirt road, plumed up its incline, stopping in front of a large cabin. This is where you live? He shut off the engine. Yeah. Cool. Inside the cabin, tall ceilings, cold fireplace, the smell of wood. She wandered through the rooms, knowing he wouldn't stop her, ending up at the rear, the kitchen. Through the large window, treetops, then beyond them, a flat, dark expanse. Took her a moment to realize it was the ocean, miles and miles below. The triangular front of her red high heel pressed down on the lever in front of the kitchen's trash can. Arms held prettily by her sides, because she knew he had followed behind her, she looked down into his garbage. You had just a baked potato for dinner? Yeah. Seriously? Ice? No ice? Whatever you're having. He handed her a whiskey on the rocks. I chop a few green onions into it, lots of butter, lots of salt and black pepper. It's actually not that bad. They sat at his kitchen table, facing each other. Did that thing with tossing her long hair again. Saw the effect it had on him. You do realize that even though I'm only 18, just a little girl in red high heels, I'm starting to gain the upper hand, right? Took another sip of his whiskey lips curling back from his white teeth at the slight sting. You're good at it, I'll give you that. I have to toy with you now, because once you've fucked me a few times, I know you'll grow disinterested. Might not. Sure. Didn't take you that long to get over your wife's death, though, right? Nine months? Now you want nothing more than to fuck some hot young girl, like you used to do when you were still young his battered face, laying it on kind of thick. I enjoy it. You're going to fuck me in the same bed your wife died in? Risky, but she liked risks. Nothing wrong with getting them a little angry, maybe even a little teary-eyed. Guess that means I'm going to get some coal in my Christmas stocking this year. Or maybe not. My wife cheated on me. Yeah. In that same bed I'm gonna fuck you in. It was the classic discovery. Got off work early, hurried home to surprise her, fuck her, hi honey, and I did surprise her, but she was already getting fucked by someone else. So it turned out she surprised me. Younger man? Saw that red rise of anger in his unshaven neck. Careful. He spread his big shoes apart on the kitchen floor hung his head. She waited. You know, it took a moment for it to register. What I was seeing, what they were doing. He was on top of her. I guess he was old-fashioned that way. But what really got me, what scared me, was how much he was enjoying what he was doing. I mean, I can understand him enjoying it, but the way he was swimming and bouncing around on top of her... Just the sheer fucking enthusiasm of it shriveled my cock. It was like he was a kid doing the most fun thing a kid could ever possibly do. I never fucked her like that. I never fucked anybody like that. I doubt I could. And it's not like his wild enthusiasm had that much of an effect on her. She actually seemed to be enjoying the fuck only to about the same degree she enjoyed getting fucked by me. So it wasn't a competition about who could fuck my wife better. It was really a thing about who could enjoy fucking my wife more. Silence from him, head down, reliving the moment. Grinned suddenly, raised his wet eyes. You know what really got me? After a few more thrusts, he realized I was in the room. Maybe his spine tingled. 
turned his face around on his shoulder and nodded at me. Fucking nodded. Like, hey, how's it going? Let me show you something. Took her through his bedroom out onto the wraparound balcony. Coldness. Darkness. Dolphins dying in the clouds. It's over here. She followed a safe distance behind him. Around a bend in the balcony, something tall slanted up towards the night sky. As they got closer, she realized it was a telescope. He bent the right side of his face down to the eyepiece, fiddled with the controls, fingers rotating gears, straightened up, smiling, looking youthful. Here, take a look. Stepped back. She bent forward, aiming her black pupil at the eyepiece, long hair spilling sideways. Jerked her young head back up. What's that? Arms swinging by his sides. Look again. She approached the eyepiece more carefully, stared into its lens, free eyes scrunched. What am I seeing? That's the International Space Station. Fuck no. Fuck yeah. It's only a couple hundred miles up in the air. See that window in the metal? One night I was looking up at the station and I saw two of the astronauts in that window, both males, and they were both naked. They were tongue kissing each other, jerking off each other's cocks. No, they weren't. What can I tell you? They were. God's honest truth. You want to spend the night with me? You want to get in bed with me now? They were already right outside his bedroom, so it was a short walk to go back through the sliding doors to his wide bed. Do you want to draw the drapes? He took off his shirt, dropped it on the white carpet. Broad chest, narrow waist, not much hair. We don't need to. Only birds can see us. I guess this is the point where either you take off your top or you glance at your wristwatch and look surprised at the time. Sheila stood in front of him, sexy, nervous, still clothed. We're going to fuck, and you're going to be the first man to fuck me face to face and take my virginity, because you're the first man I trust enough to get naked with. You passed the first two of my four tests, but here's the thing. He kept his hands at his belt buckle, looking at her, waiting. When I pull my top off, you're going to see something. Something you don't expect to see. I need you to be able to handle that. More scars? She shook her head. He dropped his fingers from his belt buckle. Show me. I can handle it. Curled those thin fingers around the bottom of her red striped top. I'm going to pull my top off all at once. Then we can talk. Nervous. Okay? The 30-year-old man nodded. Do it. Sucking in a big breath. Pulling her top up her bare torso. Up over her raised arms. Dropping the red and white stripes on his carpet. Hair tousled. Naked from the waist up. Scared look on her face. At first... He thought it was a tattoo on her stomach, but it was moving. He leaned in. A young man's face, blue eyes rolling, her belly button part of his forehead like a beauty mark. Ben's eyes went from the young man's face to her bare breasts hanging above the face, back down to the face. He's my twin brother. You ever show him to anyone else? She stood stiff-limbed, ready for rejection. Doctors, obviously. Bare-chested, he bent his knees so he could look more directly into the face. Its eyes met his, rolled away. Does he talk? Baby talk? Embarrassed. I feel like I should say hello, but... She tried swinging her long hair that sexy way again but this time it didn't quite work. Ben raised back up to his full height. Does he eat? Shook her head, breasts wobbling. 
He gets his nourishment from me. Our digestive systems are... I don't really want to get into that. He can't hear either. No ears. But he can lip read. I taught him. Hands flapping by her hips. With a mirror. What are the two you talk about? How lonely I am. Does he breathe? Not through his mouth or his nose. He gets his oxygen through my lungs, so, you know. We could put a towel over his face. Probably a good idea. Pain in her eyes. If you're still up for it. When you mentioned these four tests I had to pass, cocked a hip. I think it's something where after we fuck a few times, you'll probably get more used to it, and after a while, maybe it won't be that big a deal. Is the rest of your body normal? Like a slap across her face. You know what? Fuck you. Come on, Sheila. You don't think I have the right to take some time to adjust to this? She burst into tears, standing in front of him with her top off, the twin on her stomach rolling his eyes, looking around at the bedroom. You are just so fucking immature. When I picked you, I didn't realize you were going to be so stupid and gross. I've been looking all over for the right guy, and I thought I finally found him in you. Hard to resist a woman's tears when they're not fake, especially a young woman's tears. His fingers went back to his belt buckle, slid leather through brass, unzipped, pulled down his pants, his underpants. Full erection, and an impressive one at that. Looked down at it looked at her. He did ask that they put a towel over her twin's face, and that was fine with her. When her twin started up with his baby talk, even though it was muffled by the white towel over his face, she saw Ben needed a moment, on top of her, thrusting down, to go inside himself, to concentrate. But he stayed hard, and he stayed really deep, steady, after a few more minutes of muffled baby talk, her young arms flung around the backs of his broad shoulders, her mouth opened, stayed open. Afterwards, sweaty, side by side on their backs, on his white sheet, he stroked her upper arm. You got really energetic hips. She grinned, happy. Rolling away from her in bed, reaching for his pack of cigarettes, lighter. She accepted a lit camel, took a long drag. His deep voice. I'm not being insensitive, just curious. How did you wind up with your twin's face in your navel? I mean, you had to know I'd ask that at some point. That's reasonable. I'll tell you the answer, but you're gonna think it's bullshit. Okay. My mom was cursed by this homeless woman. What did your mom do that would make a homeless woman put a curse on her? She would never tell me. He considered what she said, conscious of her eyes on him. I don't know. Really? Oh, okay. Did I introduce you to my twin brother yet? The one growing out of my fucking navel? He conceded the point. So... I was hoping you could help me get the curse reversed. She fell quiet. He smoked himself a couple of drags. How am I supposed to do that? There's a procedure. How would you even find out there's a procedure? This old guy on a street corner with a live black crow in his green knapsack explained the procedure to me. Before you say anything, let me tell you something. You think you know what this world is about? Because you wake up to an alarm clock in the morning, go to work, come home and watch TV in the evening? You don't know shit. He told me to put a quarter in a handkerchief and spit on it every day, rewrap it, and eventually the quarter would turn into a penny. And after 18 months, it did. He sat up against his pillow. Let's just say for a minute that I believe you. If you're talking about getting the curse reversed, then you're talking about no longer having your twin brother in your navel, right? So where does he go? 
timid shrug. Don't know. Don't care? Is it such a terrible thing that I want to be normal? Wear a bikini? Right hand gesturing at her navel. What could be worse than this? Don't worry, he can't hear what we're discussing. Remember? No ears. Ben glanced at the table on his side of the bed, at the clock, getting late, and he had already fucked her. Did you love your wife? She cheated on me, Sheila. Did you cry when she died? You know, the thing is, sometimes you can go from feeling happy to feeling old just because of a few words. There should be some way around that. Despite the way you look, despite the way you talk, despite the way you behave, I think you're a good guy. A knight in an age where most knights just drink themselves to death. Am I wrong? She was so young. He let out a sigh. I work as a nurse trainee at the emergency room of a local hospital. Every night I'm surrounded by the dying. Some people make it. A lot don't. If you spend that much time with people leaving this life, you see things. Like soldiers on battlegrounds see things and usually don't talk about because it scares them. That did get his curiosity. She was still naked. So was he. A half hour had passed since they made love. His cock, dark skinned in its compression, lolling against the side of his left thigh, was starting to lengthen, straighten away from his thigh, lifting above his legs curly black hairs. Skin lightening, length rising up rigid. He was beginning to think maybe they'd make love again. She did have energetic hips, and despite his eventual hatred of her betrayals, he did cry when his wife died, because there was a time when they did love each other, and that had been a good thing. And he was, just part of his makeup, probably from childhood, a good guy, somewhere in there. At one point during the night, when most of the patient's families have left or have fallen asleep, these things crawl into the hospital. Shiver up his big spine, which surprised him. Things? Like what? Really thin things. You'll see. They carry away the dying. Select them by some criteria I don't understand and drag them away. Their souls or whatever. The bodies stay behind, but by then they're staring straight out of their eyes, the monitor flatlining. There's a little boy in the emergency room, Matthew. I can tell by the way they slither by his bed they're getting close to collecting him. If you prevent them from doing that, if Matthew gets to live and grow up and experience the rest of his shitty life, I get to reverse the curse. That's the way it works. Help out a damsel in distress? He met her the next night at the hospital. Strange to see her after the pool hall, his bedroom, in this vast high-ceilinged emergency waiting room, all these strangers filling the orange plastic chairs, suffering, praying, crying, as even more of the day's bad decisions arrived through the sliding glass of the double doors. Wearing a nurse's starchy white scrubs, white nurse's cap on her head. You keep your uniform really clean. We have to. People don't want to see body fluids on us. They'd lose hope. And in this big space, big as a church, all they have is hope. What comes next? You're early. Just find a place to sit, and when it gets close to when they usually show up, I'll come over to your chair. What are these things called? Her impatience. They don't have a name. Not everything has a name. So he wandered around the frightened groups, found an orange seat by himself. Couldn't smoke, so watched the triage nurses moving among the crowds, filling out forms trying to assess the degree of urgency with each new patient, to decide when they'd be taken through the rear doors. The room 
the fear in the air brought back memories of when he had to go with Claire to the emergency room. Different hospitals, but really all emergency rooms are the same. The first few visits, he didn't know she was cheating on him. The final visits... Around 10 in the evening, Sheila came over to where he was sitting. Want to grab a smoke? He followed her white uniform outside. They stood by the curb to the emergency room entrance, 20 feet from the glass sliding doors, where smoking was apparently allowed. Since the hospital was built on a hill, he could see the sprawl and dominoes of the city's lighted buildings. After Claire died, I just stayed in our home all the time. Just its four walls in each room. Then one day, as it was getting dark outside, it was a Saturday evening, I was in the living room doing I don't remember what, and past the front windows I heard a motorcycle rev up, tear down a nearby street. And that rev up reminded me of how much fun there is outside, and that I was still young, relatively. She borrowed his cigarette to light a fresh cigarette for herself, puffing her cold white cigarette against his orange glow, transferring fire. I love working in the emergency room, the mob of it, the stress, the way the hours race by, stooping over to talk to people in chairs, holding patients' eyes as they're wheeled around in a gurney, taking temperatures, giving injections. I lost track pretty early on how many hands I let grasp mine as they shuddered and went lifeless. I do love that experience, being there when people die. I had a dog. It died. I took it to the vet to have him administer the kill shot. Just before he was ready to push down on the plunger, his female assistant put her hand on my dog's shoulder, like she was going to feel his passing too. I pushed her hand away. I'm the owner, the one he loved. Only I get to experience him leave. A month later, still stewing about it, I snuck into the vet's parking lot, jabbed a knife into two of her tires. Two, because people only have one spare tire. A light rain started up, decided to turn into a downpour, bouncing off the pavement, wetting the bottoms of their trousers. She drew her head up on her neck. Won't be long now. The look in her eyes made her older than usual, maybe even older than him. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. And if you already know the source of stress, BetterHelp can help you find ways to cope and deal with it. School's back in session for the kiddos, meaning that there's more time than ever to be alone with your thoughts. And that's not always a good thing. Sure, there are other ways to occupy your time, such as games, nature walks, hobbies, and the like. I like to read a good book or listen to my favorite podcast. But it feels so good to be open and honest, two of the many ingredients needed for better mental health. And I love how my BetterHelp therapist provides me with the distance and semi-anonymity to do just that. BetterHelp is real, professional counseling tailored to your needs that you can do online. It's more affordable than traditional therapy, and for those who need it, financial aid is available, meaning the people who need it most can have better access to help that's, well, better. Thanks to BetterHelp, it's never been easier for me or others to care for their mental health. All you have to do is take the first step. Most anyone can benefit from counseling, whether it's depression, anxiety, internal struggles, or any other problem standing in your way. BetterHelp is the tried and true tool to get you up to task again. This is no gimmick, folks. It's professional therapy online. Quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price that's attainable. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist who specializes in your specific needs. 
You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can also schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. In short, you'll never be winging it again. Your personal counselor will always be close at hand. No office visits necessary. It's professional help right in your pocket. Not a fan of being on screen? That's okay. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And remember, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Around 11, she showed up in front of his knees. He looked up from his orange chair, lowering the magazine to his lap. Come, let's go. Brought him to the front by the double glass doors, still raining outside. She stood so close to him their hips were touching, probably to remind him how good she had been in bed. Talked out of the side of her mouth. Their big advantage? how they're able to sneak in here. Sneak out? People don't expect to see them. They wait until no one's looking, then advance. Wait, frozen, then advance some more. People in an emergency room, they're in their own heads. They aren't going to notice what's going on around them. Pressed her warm hip even more firmly against his. Stare at the front entrance. Fucking stare. Don't take your eyes off it. Don't blink, and you'll see them. Once you do see them, don't unsee them. Don't look away. He stared. Kept staring. Didn't blink. The front glass doors slid open. Ever notice when glass doors slide open but there's no one there? But now, he saw something. On the wet sidewalk just outside the doors. Shadows. Many, many shadows. Moving forward. Felt sick. Didn't want to be there. Emerging from the night. Coming into view. Crawling across the sidewalk towards those opened doors. And then like life spilling up out of the drain into a kitchen sink. Too many hands and knees. Multitudes, moving into the emergency room, knees dragging the rain in, wet streaks across the tile floor. Extraordinarily thin, like shuffling pencil lines. Heads only slightly bigger than their stick limbs. Featureless, no hair, no faces. Smooth knobs. Sheila leaned her lips against his left ear. They can't see. They can't hear. They can't smell. They lower their knobbed fronts to the floor, and the vibrations they feel tell them which direction to crawl. The stick things scurried across the emergency room floor, freezing their joints when a sad-eyed mother looked up from her orange chair and when she looked back down, scurrying deeper across the floor. It was quick. No one noticed. The emergency room was just an emergency room again. Wet trails of rain leading to the rear doors, where the helpless patients were. At some point, one of the hospital janitors would put out signs. Caution! Slippery floors. She squeezed his upper arm. Now we go back where they are. He knew this, too, going through the rear doors of an emergency room, when Claire was dying, and then miraculously revived, head jerking up, lips gasping, only to come back a month, a week, a night later, 
suffer through dying again, until that final time when her head didn't jerk up and her pretty face turned ugly. Is that what the world is? Steam and cartoons? The rain trails behind the rear door went everywhere, to each curtained cubicle. Nurses walking around on errands, not noticing, or some of them, ignoring. Sheila led him to the nearest white curtain. That smell, overpowering. What did it remind him of? Took a moment. Lemons. Long, stick things dripping rain everywhere inside the cubicle, piled up on the floor, joints flexing, crawling across the walls, trying out the ceiling. In the hospital bed, a white-haired man in a pinstriped hospital gown, staring up at the ceiling, lips moving. Folded on the cubicle's tall table, the clothes he had been wearing when he was admitted, red and black plaid shirt, gray slacks, probably never put them back on. Ben whispered into Sheila's ear, does he know they're here? She mouthed, I don't know. The things piled up higher, knobbed fronts reaching the level of the bed. All those joints bending forward, greedily climbing over the edge of the mattress. Her quiet voice, no one to protect him, took him by his upper arm, led him down the corridor to a curtain on the right. Her voice at normal level again. Here's the boy. Drew the curtain to one side. A little brown-haired boy, sleeping in his oversized hospital bed. What do I do? Get in bed with him. Wait. When the things find his cubicle, don't let them up on the bed with him. Push them back. Punch them. This isn't about spells or lighting candles. It has to be the most basic, ancient physical defense there is. Your fists. If you can discourage them, they'll eventually give up. Move on to another cubicle. He'll survive the night and continue to get better. He won't die, and my curse will be reversed. Are you going to help? I can't. I have to get back to my job. Are you a good guy, Ben? Are you? Yeah, but... You didn't save your wife, but you can save this little boy. Or you can just leave now. Go home. Get drunk like you do every night. Which is it? After she left the cubicle, he climbed up on the bed. Feeling uncomfortable. Thirty-year-old man in bed with a little boy he doesn't know. Glanced down. Brown bangs. Snub nose thin face, hollow eye sockets, smelled bad, stared at the front curtains of the cubicle. For a long time, nothing. Scuttling sounds from far away. Didn't want to imagine what they were doing. Long, thin shadows projected on the white side curtain dividing the boy's cubicle from the one next door his scared eyes, shadows mixing, overlapping on the side curtain, a knobbed, featureless head poking underneath his cubicle's front curtain. As he watched, it lay its knobbed front against the floor, waiting for vibrations, held his breath. More knobbed fronts poking under the front curtain, lying their heads on the floor, Hands in front of him, motionless. Sweat rolling down from his armpits. Stick things surging into his cubicle. Jointed limbs climbing up the side curtains. Noise over his head. One of them was four-legged on the ceiling. Knobbed front swinging down, left, right, questing. Stick thing rising up the side of the hospital bed, blindly touching its rounded front to the mattress, articulating forward 
across his body towards the boy. He hit it. The knob swung wildly back and forth, furious. Punched it again. Swung a fist under it, up, smacking it backwards. Leaned across the boy, who woke, confused, punching at three things on the other side. Felt two of them crawl over him from the other side of the bed, knees and elbows painful against his back. Swung at them. Let out a cry. Kicked at the horde crawling up onto him. Yanked one or two off the boy. Punched left. Punched right. Rolled onto his back, kicking out, butting with his forearms. Grabbed one around its skinny neck with his left hand, right hand pummeling into the knob. Sucking in huge breaths. Starting to lose. Only so many punches in your fists before they no longer lift. Lay on his side, chest heaving, head pounding. One of the things climbed confidently atop the boy, lowered its knob. Up this close, the size of an unlit light bulb. Like a foreskin, the glossy knob split open, slid back. What was inside, wet, red, sat on the boy's terrified face, spreading from ear to ear. His fist knocked the embrace sideways off the boy's face. The knob reared up, switching angrily above Ben's head. Knuckles smacking against its sway, left, right, until the wet redness retracted and the stick thing slithered backwards. All of them withdrew from the cubicle, shadows lifting against the white side curtain of the next cubicle. No strength to rise off the bed. He let his body collapse sideways on the sheets, fell asleep, dreamt about his ear being touched. That tickle got him into a sitting position, looking over his shoulder. But it was just the little brown-haired boy looking up at him, cheeks wet, a smile just for Ben. He got out of bed, staggered through the white front curtain, having trouble waving it away from his walk, bruises on his face, knuckles. A young man standing in the white curtained aisle of the ICU, wearing clothes that looked familiar. Red and black plaid shirt, gray pants. The white-haired man's clothes from the first cubicle. And the face, bashful, looked familiar. Took him a moment. Her twin. All the guilt he had been suppressing left. The curse had been reversed, and the twin had survived. He wanted to hug the twin, but didn't want to frighten him. Have you seen your sister yet? Does she know? The twin seemed confused by the sounds coming out of Ben's mouth, which made sense. He's only had ears for a few minutes, but he could lip read. A nod. He lifted the front of his plaid shirt. You've been listening to Not Everything Has a Name by Ralph Robert Moore. You can find this and many other tales from Ralph on his website, www.ralphrobertmoore.com. That's Moore with two O's, M-O-O-R-E. That's it for tonight, but I'll be back with you here again next week to finish out Season 6. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'll see you right here at this same time next week. Be sure to stick around, because in two weeks we have the beginning of Season 7, where Horror Hill will get a revamp in look and sound.
Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I do take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure that you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.